Hello, and welcome to another compelling episode of the Global Intelligence Weekly Wrap-Up, covering the week ending August 23, 2024. Today, you're in for an exclusive journey into the real world of intelligence and national security. Your host, Neil Bisson, a retired intelligence officer with over 20 years of international experience, is here to share his unparalleled insights and analysis. With a career rooted in the Canadian Security Intelligence Service and now as the director of the Global Intelligence Knowledge Network, Neil brings you the kind of expert perspective that few can offer. This week's episode is packed with the most pressing and fascinating stories in global terrorism, high-stakes espionage, and the ever-evolving landscape of national security. You're not just getting the news, you're gaining access to the deep, nuanced understanding that comes only from decades of on-the-ground experience. And trust me, you'll want to stay tuned until the very end to catch every bit of valuable insight. Before we delve into today's stories, I want to extend a heartfelt thank you for your continued support. By subscribing to the Global Intelligence Weekly Wrap-Up on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or simply asking your smart speaker to play it, you're ensuring you stay connected with the most critical intelligence updates. If you value the insights you're getting, please leave a comment, give us a rating, and share the podcast with your network. Your feedback drives us to keep delivering the in-depth, high-quality content that you rely on. And if you're looking to take your support to the next level, consider becoming a supporter at buzzsprout.com slash 2336717 slash support. Every contribution empowers us to continue providing the vital intelligence analysis that keeps you informed and ahead of the curve. Now, without further ado, let's dive into this week's episode of the Global Intelligence Weekly Wrap-Up. We're thrilled to have you with us, and remember, stick around to the end to get all the insights you won't want to miss. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Global Intelligence Weekly Wrap-Up. In our first story, we're diving into a major issue brewing within Canada's top security agency, the Security Intelligence Service. Our focus is on the article entitled Friction Among Regional Spies, Shadowy Seizes HQ Unit, a Challenge for the New Intelligence Boss, which highlights the growing tensions within CSIS and the challenges that the next director will face. The article sheds light on a significant issue within CSIS, the internal friction between intelligence officers and regional offices and those stationed in Ottawa headquarters. This friction is reportedly hampering CSIS's ability to effectively investigate and disrupt Chinese foreign interference in Canada. From an intelligence perspective, this disconnect is not just an internal matter, but has broader implications for Canada's national security. When there's a breakdown in communication and cooperation within any intelligence agency, especially one tasked with protecting the nation from foreign interference, it directly affects the agency's ability to respond to the threats in a timely and effective manner. In this case, intelligence collected by regional officers about China's activities is either delayed, downplayed, or never reaches the key decision makers who need it. This is a serious concern, especially given the growing threat of foreign interference in Canadian politics. To understand the gravity of the situation, it's important to look at the broader context. Similar issues of disconnect within intelligence agencies have occurred in the past, not just in Canada, but globally. For instance, the lack of coordination between U.S. intelligence agencies was a significant factor that contributed to the intelligence failures before the 9-11 attacks. In Canada, the stakes are high as the country faces increasing pressure from powers like China which are actively seeking to influence Canadian politics and policies. The article also highlights the insights from the National Security and Intelligence Review Agency, NSERA, and the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, NSCOP. These agencies pointed out that the tensions within CSIS have been brewing since 2019 and are further exasperated by different priorities and poor communication. From the perspective of an intelligence officer who had the opportunity to work in several regions and international offices, I can attest to the fact that conflicting priorities between regions and headquarters can be a substantial hurdle to overcome for any security and intelligence organization. The intelligence collected by officers on the ground is vital, and if it's poorly analyzed and disseminated, it diminishes their efforts and can influence collection efforts and morale. The world of intelligence collection is a fast-moving and ever-changing one. Certain regions whose collection efforts are at a lower priority one day can see a significant change in priorities the next. Conversely, The efforts of regional intelligence offices to identify the need for prioritization of collection against security and intelligence threats 
can see this pushback or reluctance from headquarters for a myriad of reasons, including, but not limited to, the following. 1. Direction from executive and management to focus on issues that aren't reflected in the region. 2. A lack of corroborating information or intelligence that demonstrates a growing threat issue. 3. Lack of necessary resources to change priority as quickly or as often as needed. 4. Reluctance by managers and executives to accept that the threat landscape has changed and needs to be addressed. And 5. Regional intelligence collectors in their offices may feel that investigation efforts are being overlooked because of more pressing threat and intelligence collection priorities are primary focus of headquarters, the Canadian intelligence community, or the government of Canada. As mentioned, these are just a few examples of what causes a rift between intelligence professionals in the field and those mandated with analyzing, assessing, and collaborating the information and intelligence that is being collected. In summary, the challenges within CSIS are not just about internal friction, but about the broader implications for Canada's national security. The director and future director of the service will need to embrace these ever-present issues and try to find new and innovative ways to address them. As we watch this development unfold, it's crucial for Canada's security apparatus and the intelligence community to adapt and overcome these challenges. In our next story, we've got a crucial update on the pressures faced by Canada's National Police Force as they strive to protect our country's leaders amid growing threats. In a Global Mail article entitled, RCMP has struggled to staff unit dedicated to protection of politicians, records show, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, or the RCMP, is under significant strain as the demands to protect parliamentarians and other public figures continues to escalate. According to a newly released internal briefing note, the RCMP is being stretched thin, with resources being diverted from other critical federal policing priorities to meet these increasing security needs. The February memo, which was obtained through the Access to Information Act, highlights the delicate balance the RCMP is forced to maintain. They must prioritize protective services based on threat assessments, which are becoming more frequent as the number of threats against public figures continues to rise. The internal documents warn that labor market conditions are specialized training requirements for close protection officers pose significant challenges. The RCMP is projected to need an additional 235 close protection officers over the next five years to meet the growing demand and cover the expected 20% attrition rate due to promotions, transfers, and retirements. With large events like the North American Leaders Summit, the 2025 G7 meeting, and the 2026 Soccer World Cup on the horizon, the RCMP's resources will be stretched even further. The memo emphasizes the need for constant review and strategic planning to balance risks and resources effectively. In response to these challenges, RCMP Commissioner Mike Dehem has advocated for new legislation that would make it easier to pursue charges against individuals who threaten elected officials. However, this idea has seen mixed reactions. While the Justice Minister believes the current criminal code provisions are adequate, there's also been a suggestion for creating protective zones around politicians and political offices to safeguard MPs and their staff. The growing threat environment, coupled with the strain on the RCMP's resources, paints a concerning picture for the future of protective services in Canada. It's clear that strategic planning, effective communications, and possibly new legislative tools will be crucial in ensuring the safety of Canada's public figures. For this next story, we travel to the Philippines, where we are diving into a story that's been stirring up a lot of controversy. We're talking about the recent headlines surrounding former Mayor Alice Guao, who's now on the run, suspected of spying for China and being involved with criminal syndicates. Let's get into it. So the title of this article is Fury as Suspected China Spy Flees the Philippines. In a nutshell, we have former Mayor Alice Guao, who is now at the center of criminal investigation in the Philippines. She's accused of spying for China and has fled the country, which has sparked national outcry. President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. has expressed his outrage, declaring that heads will roll as this case unfolds. Alice Guao, the former mayor of Bam Bam, a small farming town, was under investigation for her alleged links to criminal syndicates and online casinos. Things escalated when she refused to testify before a Senate panel in July, leading to a warrant for her arrest. But rather than face the charges, she managed to slip out of the country undetected by traveling through Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia. From an intelligence perspective, this case is significant for several reasons. First, it underscores the vulnerability of national borders and the ease with which high-profile individuals can evade justice. 
The fact that Guo managed to escape despite the ongoing investigation raises serious concerns about corruption and the effectiveness of the Philippines' border security and intelligence apparatus. Moreover, Guo's alleged tie to human trafficking and scam operations disguised as online casino points to a broader issue of how criminal enterprises are increasingly using sophisticated fronts to operate. This is a growing trend, not just in the Philippines, but globally, as technology and online platforms provide new opportunities for illicit activities. To put this into context, Alex Guao's case is a part of a larger pattern of corruption and foreign interference that has been plaguing the Philippines. While POGOs, or Philippine Offshore Gaming Operators, have been around for years, they have come under increased scrutiny under the new current administration. President Marcos Jr. has reversed the pro-China stance of his predecessor, Rodrigo Duterte, and has been cracking down on the Pogo-linked crime since taking office in 2022. What's more, this case is happening against the backdrop of rising nationalist sentiment in the Philippines. The country's ongoing territorial dispute with China over the South China Sea is fueling public anger and suspicion towards Chinese nationals and businesses operating in the country. Guo's Chinese heritage and her alleged spying for China only added fuel to the fire. In terms of expert opinions, Senator Risa Monteveros, who has been leading the investigation into the Philippines scam centers, did not mince words. She called Guo a fake Filipino and criticized the fact that she has been able to use her Philippine passport to escape. This sentiment reflects the broader public anger and frustration with how the situation has been handled. From my perspective, the most concerning aspect here is the erosion of public trust in government institutions. When high-profile figures like Guao can evade justice so easily, it not only undermines the rule of law but also emboldens others who might be involved in similar activities. It's a clear signal that reforms are urgently needed, particularly in the areas of border security, immigration controls, and anti-corruption measures. The case involving Alice Guao is a reminder of the challenges that countries like the Philippines face combating corruption, foreign interference, and organized crime. It's also a cautionary tale for any municipality or province in Canada. It demonstrates the need to ensure that any individual running for office should be subjected to stringent security screening before acquiring a position in the government. As the story unfolds, it will be important to watch how the Philippine government responds and what this means for their ongoing investigations to strengthen national security. Looking ahead, we might see more stringent measures being put in place, not just in the Philippines, but other countries facing similar issues. The global intelligence community will certainly be keeping a close eye on this case and its broader implications. We move on to Southeast Asia for our next story, where we're exploring a news article that bridges the gap between cyber terrorism and international unrest. The article we're discussing is from the BBC and is entitled Pakistan Arrest Man Over Southport Attack Disinformation. Pakistani authorities have arrested a man named Farhan Ashif, on suspicion of cyber terrorism. Asif is accused of spreading disinformation that allegedly fueled violent unrest in the UK following a tragic stabbing attack in Southport, where three young girls lost their lives. His actions, according to the police, contributed to the spread of false information that incited riots across England and Northern Ireland. Farhan Asif reportedly ran a website called Channel 3 Now, where he published an article that incorrectly identified the Southport attacker as an asylum seeker who had arrived in the UK on a small boat. This piece of disinformation quickly went viral on social media, igniting far-right protests and violent riots in several UK cities. From an intelligence standpoint, this case highlights the growing threat of cyber terrorism and the dangerous role that disinformation plays in modern conflicts. The ability of a single unverified article to spark widespread unrest underscores the power of online platforms in shaping public opinion and inciting violence. It's a stark reminder of how misinformation can be weaponized by individuals or groups with malicious intent, leading to real-world consequences. To provide some background, the riots that erupted following the Southport attack were fueled by a combination of factors, including rising anti-immigration sentiment and the influence of far-right groups in the UK. The disinformation spread by Channel 3 added fuel to the fire, further polarizing communities and escalating tensions. This incident is not isolated. We've seen several cases in the past where disinformation has been used to incite violence and unrest. The, the rapid spread of false information online is a growing concern for governments and intelligence agencies worldwide. It can undermine social cohesion and national security. According to the police report, Farhan Asif admitted to copying the false information from a UK-based social media account without verifying its authenticity. 
He claimed that he ran their website alone and that his intent was simply to share national and international news. However, the police have filed a case against him on the grounds that his actions created a sense of fear, panic, and insecurity among the public and the government. In my professional analysis, this case is a clear example of the risks associated with rapid dissemination of unverified information online. It also raises important questions about the responsibilities of the content creators and whether individuals are more concerned about acquiring likes than they are about providing accurate content of value. From a more nefarious perspective, sharing false information of this kind can lead to civic unrest. And if a hostile enemy state or if a non-state actor feels it would better their interest to cause mayhem, they will. The arrest of Farhan Asif in Pakistan over the South Port attack disinformation is a reminder of the powerful and often dangerous role that cyber activities play in an interconnected world. As this case develops, it will be important to watch how Pakistan and the UK authorities address the broader issue of online disinformation and the impact on national security. As we look to the future, there needs to be an increased focus on international cooperation to combat cyber terrorism and the spread of false information. For now, the key takeaway is the importance of staying vigilant and critically evaluating the sources of information we consume. In our next story, we take a look at an article entitled, How Does the CIA Recruit Russian Spies? from the Cyber Brief. This article focuses on how the CIA is innovating to recruit Russian spies. With a unique approach that leverages social media and modern technology, the CIA is targeting disaffected Russians who may be ready to turn against their government. This article from the Cyber Brief provides an in-depth look at these recruitment strategies and their implications. The CIA has traditionally relied on face-to-face -face meetings and covert operations to recruit spies, but this approach has evolved in recent years. As detailed in the article, the agency has turned to social media, releasing a series of high production videos aimed at Russians who are dissatisfied with their government, particularly in the wake of the war in Ukraine. These videos, which started appearing online in 2022, provided a step-by-step -step instruction on how to safely contact the CIA, emphasizing secrecy and security. The shift to this digital strategy is significant. It shows how espionage is adapting to the realities of the 21st century, where technology can be both a tool and a battleground. From an intelligence perspective, this strategy is a bold move. By going public with their recruitment efforts, the CIA is not only reaching a wider audience, but also sending a clear message to the Russian government that there are citizens within their borders who are willing to collaborate with the West. To put this into context, Russia has always been a challenging environment for espionage. The country's intelligence services are known for their aggressive counterintelligence measures, making it difficult for foreign operatives to operate within its borders. This new approach by the CIA, using digital platforms like YouTube and Telegram, allows them to bypass some of these traditional barriers. The timing is crucial as well. The ongoing war in Ukraine has created widespread discontent within Russia, and the CIA is capitalizing on that disaffection. The agency's director, William Burns, has even described the current situation as a once-in-a-generation opportunity to recruit Russian assets. Comparing this to past espionage efforts, the use of social media represents a departure from Cold War tactics of dead drops and walk-ins at embassies. However, the underlying goal remains the same, to gather intelligence that can be used to influence and undermine adversarial governments. Experts interviewed in this article include former CIA officers Dan Hoffman and Paul Colby, highlighting the effectiveness of this modern recruitment strategy. Hoffman points out that while cyberspace has been used by Russia to spread propaganda and disinformation, the CIA is now turning the tables by using it to recruit spies. Colby draws parallels to past events, noting that major geopolitical shifts, like the collapse of the Soviet Union, has historically led to spikes in espionage activity. The war in the Ukraine is another such event, providing fertile ground for the CIA's recruitment efforts. In my analysis, the CIA move is both innovative and pragmatic. By adapting to new technologies, they are ensuring that their intelligence gathering capabilities remain robust, even in an increasingly digital world. This approach also demonstrates the CIA's understanding of the changing landscape of espionage, where information is both the target and the tool. The CIA's new approach to recruiting Russian spies via social media is a fascinating departure and development in the world of intelligence. It highlights the agency's adaptability and the importance of leveraging modern technology and espionage. As traditional methods become more challenging, this digital strategy offers a new avenue for gathering critical intelligence.
We return to Canada for our next story, where we're discussing a controversial and alarming issue within Canadian Canada's own borders. We're discussing Canadian terror apologist Charlotte Cates and her unsettling connections to the Iranian regime. The article highlights Kate's activities, including her receipt of an award from Iran, a country notorious for its human rights abuses and sponsorship of terrorism. Let's start by examining a central figure of the story, Charlotte Cates. Cates is international coordinator for Semedin, a Canadian nonprofit that advocates for Palestinian prisoners. However, this organization has deep ties to the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a group that Canada and many other countries has designated as a terrorist organization. Cates was recently awarded the Islamic Human Rights Award by Iran for her anti-Israel activities. This recognition from a regime with one of the world's worst human rights records is far from an honor. This is yet another reminder of the extremist ideologies that are being celebrated and supported by some of our own society. Cates' activities go beyond mere advocacy. She was arrested in Vancouver earlier this year for her role in a hate crime investigation after publicly praising the October 7th massacre in Israel where over 1,200 civilians were brutally murdered. Yet despite her arrest and the ongoing investigation, Cates continues to propagate her extremist views, now with the backing of Tehran. To fully understand the gravity of the situation, we need to consider broader implications. Iran is a known state sponsor of terrorism, funding and arming groups like Hamas, Hezbollah, and the PFLP. These organizations have been responsible for countless acts of violence, including attacks on Israeli civilians and military targets. The fact that Kate and her husband, Khalid Barakat, have been able to operate in Canada, organizing rallies and spreading propaganda is deeply concerning. It raises questions about the effectiveness of Canada's counterterrorism measures and the government's commitment to preventing and spreading extremist ideologies within its borders. Kat's appearance on Iranian television, where she denounced her arrest as a conspiracy by Zionist organizations, further illustrates the dangerous intersection of domestic radicalization and foreign interference. Iran's recognition of her efforts is not just an endorsement, it's a signal that the regime sees value in using Western radicals like Kate's to further their own geopolitical goals. Other experts in the field of terrorism and national security have voiced serious concern about the activities of Semedun and its leaders. The organization has been banned in Israel and Germany for its connections to terrorism, and even major financial institutions like Visa and PayPal have cut ties with them due to their extremist affiliations. From my perspective, the situation of Charlene Cates and her alignment with Iran highlights a critical vulnerability in Canada's approach to counterterrorism. While the Trudeau government has taken some steps to address hate speech and radicalization, the fact that individuals like Cates can continue to operate with impunity shows that more needs to be done. The connection between domestic radicals and foreign state sponsors of terrorism is a growing threat and must be addressed with urgency. This is not just about protecting Canadian values, it's about ensuring the safety and security of all citizens. The story of Charlotte Cates is a sobering reminder of the dangers posed by domestic extremists with international support. As we continue to navigate the complexities of global global intelligence, it's crucial that we remain vigilant in identifying and countering these threats. The recognition of Cates by Iran underscores the importance of a robust and proactive approach to counterterrorism. At our final story, we're discussing a significant espionage case out of the United States. The story centers on Yu Jung Tang, a New York resident and former pro-democracy activist who was charged with acting as an agent for China's Ministry of State Security, or the MSS, over a five-year period, from 2018 to 2023. The article comes from Al Jazeera News Media and is entitled, U.S. Charges Former Democracy Activist with Spying for China. Tang's case is a profound example of how international espionage can intersect with the lives of individuals who were once perceived as champions of democracy. According to the Department of Justice, Tang provided the MSS with information on individuals and groups considered adverse to China's interests, including U.S.-based Chinese democracy activists and dissidents. From an intelligence perspective, this case underscores the links to which the Chinese intelligence agencies will go to monitor and suppress dissent, even beyond their borders. The fact that Tang, a pro-democracy activist who participated in the 1989 Tiananmen Square protest, was allegedly turned into an informant for the Chinese government raises critical questions about coercion, recruitment, and exploitation of vulnerable groups. To understand the gravity of this case, it's important to consider Tang's story. 
In 1989, he was actively involved in the Chinese pro-democracy movement that culminated in the Tiananmen Square Massacre. Following his participation, Tang was sentenced to 20 years in prison by Chinese authorities, serving eight before he was released. His subsequent life as an advocacy for democracy in China, his repeated detentions, and his eventual asylum in the United States portrays a man deeply committed to the cause of freedom, making his alleged betrayal even more shocking. Historically, the Chinese Ministry of State Security has been known for its aggressive intelligence operations, often targeting Chinese nationals abroad, particularly those involved in dissent activities. Tang's case reflects a broader strategy by the Chinese government to infiltrate and neutralize opposition movements, even those that have taken root in foreign nations like the United States. The Department of Justice charges against Tang include acting as an agent for the MSS and making material false statements to the FBI. The use of encrypted communications as detailed by the Department of Justice statement highlights the sophisticated methods employed in modern espionage, where digital tools play a central role in maintaining clandestine relationships. This case brings up some important and startling questions surrounding screening of potential immigrants and the manipulation of systems by foreign actors. An individual like Tang, who appears to be a pro-democracy dis dissident from China, could in fact be a well-placed spy or become one. This happens as foreign states are aware that individuals who are fleeing a repressive regime are not going to be verified with local, state, or federal departments to the governments they are fleeing from by the countries they are fleeing to. This provides a unique opportunity for foreign intelligence organizations to supplant spies into the society of a host country, with little to no suspicion by that country's security screening apparatus. Tang's case serves as a critical reminder of the ongoing espionage threats posed by state actors like China. Conversely, this could also be a case of targeting a diaspora community and the manipulation of individuals with traumatic pasts. This is a tactic that underscores the ruthless nature of global intelligence operations. Either way, the charges against Tang reveal the, the far-reaching and insidious nature of the Chinese intelligence activities. This is not just about one man, but about the broader implications for national security and the integrity of dissent movements worldwide. As we continue to follow this story, it's essential to remain vigilant about the methods and motivations behind espionage in our increasingly interconnected world. Please remember that all links to the stories are included in the show notes below. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Global Intelligence Weekly Wrap-Up. We put in a tremendous amount of effort to bring you expert insights and analysis on the critical global intelligence issues that shape our world. If you found value in today's episode, I strongly encourage you to show your support. Visit buymeacoffee.com slash gikn or buzzsprout.com slash 2336717 slash support to contribute. Your support directly fuels our ability to deliver the high-quality, in-depth discussions you rely on each week. Whether it's through a one-time donation or ongoing support, every bit helps us continue to bring you the expert perspectives that truly matter. And before you go, don't forget to hit that like button, leave a comment, and share this podcast with your network. Your engagement is what helps us grow and reach more listeners who value real-world intelligence insights. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or simply ask your smart speaker to play Global Intelligence Weekly Wrap-Up so you never miss an episode. We appreciate your continued support, and we'll see you next week with more essential analysis and insights. As always, stay curious, stay informed, and stay safe.